my parents gave this to me, and it was in my little shuttle when I came over uh, from Krypton. They said, where to the premiere? Um, no, I got it on the internet. One of the things I really liked about the filming was that I didn't realize it was you, even though it, uh, it, it won't make the question won't make sense. I know it's you, but the voice work is so good, I would not have right. known it's you. you know, How do you do the voices? I, um, you know, I, I, I read everybody's comments on the internet, and they really wanted. People really yearn for a difference between not only Clark and Superman, but Superman and the other Superman and Rain and the Superman. And I tried to change my voice for our voice directors and, and sound engineers really put a few people's voices in there. It's really cool what everybody did. So it was something that we consciously thought about going, going into it. Are you, are you really comfortable with the role now? I believe this is your uh, this is your fifth or sixth time now to Superman? I don't think you're ever comfortable with Superman. It's such a scary, big boots to fill, you know? But um, I get more comfortable every film, yeah. And also wearing this outfit I mean, makes me feel comfortable. Nice. Nice. Uh-huh. All right, so, hey, how did you approach playing Cyborg Superman going from loving Superman to hating him and wanting to kill him? Well, who wouldn't go from loving to hating Superman if he killed your wife, right? I mean, Superman's Superman for everybody else except for my love of my life. So, I think uh, Hank Henshaw becoming Cyborg Superman isn't just there to be evil or to, like, uh, do bad or anything like that. He's there to right a wrong. He's there to show Superman, uh, uh, you know, how you actually are supposed to do it. Because Cyborg Superman is not going to let people down. And if he gets some vengeance along the way, then, you know, that's not a bad thing either. All right. When you approach them, you seem to feel that he's a sympathetic character, or at least a sympathetic individual, even though he's pretty much a bad guy. Is that how you approach them? Well, yeah, absolutely, because he's a, you know, Hank, Hank's a human. He was, he was there waiting for Superman to help save him and his crew and his wife, and Superman didn't show up. And so his wife is gone, and so consequently, you know, uh, he is... He's desperately trying to bring his life, his, his wife back from the dead, right? He's trying to change his circumstance, and that's tragic and it's awful. So, you know, his punches are fueled with love, and when things finally don't go correct for him, you know, I, I think the audience, and this is a tribute to uh, the writing and the animation, which I think is fantastic. I think there's an arc with Cyborg Superman in this film, without a doubt. Okay, we're here with Chris Williams, who voices Steel in Reign of the Superman. What was your approach to playing Steel, who's uh, pretty much trying to pick up where Superman is, leaving well, that vacuum? Yeah, I mean, it was pretty much a, kind of a, a labor of love for me, because growing up, Superman was always my favorite superhero, So, and I'm a, such a huge superhero fan in general. So it was easy for me to just step into Steel, because he's he's such a huge admirer of Superman, he owes his life to Superman, Superman's his favorite, and it, so it was kind of like, Art imitated life for me. It was really easy to step into. Uh, if you had to summarize Steel, yeah. okay, to the best of your ability, who is Steel? I mean, what, he, what makes him want to put on a suit of armor and go out and do these things? Well, I mean, I think the fact that I mean, you know, he, he as a direct result, he's alive of, of, from Superman, from from a hero stepping in and helping him, and so he now has that responsibility, of, like the pay it forward. He's the ultimate pay it forward. And, and, you know, in the film, he's probably got the most purest intentions. He's not out for greed. He's not out for power. He's just simply wanted to give back what was given to him and, you know, help his, his hero. Okay, we're here with Nandi Nandi, who voices Martian Manhunter. So, how you doing? How does Martian Manhunter react to the death of Superman? Probably his closest thing to a brother in this series. Yeah, hey, I mean, it's family. So, I mean, he's heartbroken. Um... I mean, that's losing a leader. And, um, you know, feeling... I feel like he's the closest thing... That he, he's the one person in Superman that will understand Martian Manhunter as far as what he's going through, being someone... Uh, the only... One of the only surviving people of his own, of his own planet. And so, to lose someone like that, it's heartbreaking. Something else you may not be aware of, but yeah. going around with a lot of the online guys, you have a lot of respect for your comic book knowledge. Yes. It's not just uh, it's not just a gossamer ephemeral knowledge either. Yeah. How do you come across it? How do you come by it? You're a real big comics fan. Yeah, I'm a huge comics fan. I you know I grew up reading comic strips, and um, so I mean everything, anything comic strips I read, 
and watched every cartoon, anything I could, anything DC, Marvel, anything as far as uh, television was concerned. And then um, later on, because like, we moved around a lot, I didn't know that there were comic book stores that existed. And then when I moved to New York, um, this was 20 years ago, someone was like, hey, I go to the comic book store every Wednesday. I was like, you go to a comic book store every Wednesday? What? What's going on? But, yeah, can I follow you? So he took me. And we went to Midtown Comics, and from then on, I mean, every single day, I'm always like, I'm reading a comic. I try to read a comic a day. So yeah, I'm, I'm in it. I'm in. I'm all in. Yeah. So, you have Tony Todd who voiced Darkseid yes, in Reign of the Superman. Yes. What was your approach to voicing the greatest evil character in the DC Universe? Well, I like the way you said that, the greatest evil character in the DC Universe. Um, I had done him twice before in Lego, so I just wanted which is a little blockier, more for, you know, under 10 year olds. So I wanted a chance to make him adult, and I wanted to focus on his plot plan, on his intellectualism, on his cunning. He's a, he's a very manipulative person, and I wanted to be able to catch all of And make sure, the trick about bad guys, you don't want to play them as bad guys. You want to play them as if they have the right answer, and everybody else is doing So. Do we expect to see you continue to play Dark Side for future films? Perhaps. Perhaps not. Perhaps. Well, I can't legally say. <laughs> hey, we're here with Sam Liu, director for Reign of Superman. Uh, what was the end result that you were hoping to get for the second part? The first part came in with a real lot of thunder, really big bang. How did you want to follow that up with the sequel? Um, you know, I think... Uh, Part of the reason why we even uh, did this story was you know, for the fans, right? And so um, I think it was difficult because we knew that this is the first time that any one of the four uh, have been represented on screen, and so we really wanted to, uh, you know, make sure that they were represented well and that uh, a fan of you know, whether you're a fan of each one of them that they have their moment. Um, How you doing? But we also knew that we sort of had to tell the, you know, like the story of Superman, like what happens, you know, when it's gone, you know, what happens to the people, uh, you know, it's, it, it, you know, what are we, where are we going plot-wise with these four Supermen, and uh, and set it up for his return, so his return uh, hopefully becomes glorious and becomes a Christopher Reeve movie, basically. What was the most challenging aspect of this film in terms of execution for the story? Um, I think this one is just because there were so many characters, um, well, the four, you know, main, obviously lovable characters, um, and then there was the plot, um, and also just in the, in the back of our heads, like, you know, the, the uh, source material that we were working on, you know, what, what was supposed to happen, not, not sort of like exactly beat for beat what happened, but what was the feel and the, the flow of uh, what happened, and... Uh, it was a lot. It was just a lot of story ended with basically the relevance of you know uh, and the celebration of Superman returning. This is the second DC animated feature that was two parts. The first was Dark Death Knight of Superman. Um, the first part was Death of Superman, and this is the uh, Reign of the Superman. Right. Uh, it's the second storyline that you guys have broken into two parts, right? Um, yeah. If you count um, Dark Knight Returns, yes. Right, right. So. Why did this story need two parts as opposed to just trying to fit it all in one? Uh, have you read Death yes. of Superman? <laughs> it needs three, it needs four parts actually, but um, uh, I think when they did Doomsday, the original version of the story, they realized that there was more story to be told. And so, fast forward, it was that was ten years ago, they did, um, they took a gamble on uh, Dark Knight Returns and did a two-parter and that did really well for them and so the powers that be decided to go back and, and retell the Death of Superman story and this time they gave us enough real estate to play with to tell the death part but also the rebirth part so um, it was a uh, it was to our credit as that they believed in us and gave us those two parts because it's a risky financial proposition you know luckily they're doing well which goes to my next question are you at all surprised at the success that you've had with the two parts it's been very successful um I am slightly uh, surprised because this story we already did uh, 10 years ago, but I, 
I just wasn't sure how it would do because people have a short, you know, they think De uh, Doomsday came out the other day, you know, because people discover different movies at different times. And, uh, you know, when we first announced it, there was a lot of uh, pushback saying, oh, they're doing this story again? But um, I guess we did something right, so it did well. And so now I'm, I'm grateful we did it. Right, so we see that Superman's outfit changes from that, uh, let's say the animated outfit he was given from Justice League War. Right. And by the end of the film, he's in his uh, rebirth outfit. Yeah. Any reason why he wasn't in the classic outfit by the end of the storyline? Um, like the trunks and stuff? Is that what you asked? Oh, I can't remember the specific thinking behind it. I think we wanted to have something that looked more traditional but was reflective of what's in the comics at the time. You know, meaning now, not necessarily throwing back to the original comic. But um, I'm not like pro or anti trunk. You know what I mean? Trunks on the outside. So it's like, you know, uh, I'll do whatever the story dictates and whatever my collaborators are feeling. Can we expect to see him in the trunks now that he's back in the trunks in the comics? Uh, I can't really speak to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm always game, man. Like, it depends on the, it depends on the script, and it depends on what the project calls for, you know what I mean? If we're doing a story where that seems right, then yeah, for sure. I'm a fan of voice work, uh, as I am clearly a gigantic human with a, uh, a look as such, and I think that I like voice work because you can sort of, you know, give all that up and just inhabit, uh, you know, superheroes or, you know, anthropomorphic creatures or something like that. Uh, what's the approach to it? I mean, for the, for the character that you're doing, okay, what's your approach? Um, I think it's all, it's always about trying to find like a truthful uh, place to come from. So a lot of it's listening. We had a really great voice director with Wes Gleason. Uh, he interacts with us really well, so a lot of it's just kind of listening and and uh, trying to, I mean, you know, you're just in a booth, so we've got this whole world. We've got these big fights. We've got uh, uh, a, a lot of things going on, and so trying to imagine all of that, and then you really only have your voice to express it. It's a challenge, and it's also a great joy to do. It's a lot of fun.